I'm going to present today what we've been doing on open and fair uh, data specifically for uh, COVID-19. So within Elixir Belgium, we've spent the last year quite some time on improving the fairness and the openness of COVID-19 data. And we did this in the context of Elixir. And uh, I'm head of note for Elixir Belgium. And just to introduce this, Elixir is an intergovernmental organization. So it has nodes across Europe and 23 uh, countries. And its aim is to bring together the bioinformatic resources that are available in all of these countries and make one coherent ecosystem out of them. And this spans databases, tools, training materials, standards, compute resources, basically all the infrastructure that you need to run bioinformatic analysis. The way Elixir is organized is that there are five platforms these combine the technical experts in all these nodes around, for example, tools or interoperability. And we have communities uh, which ground us into the actual uh, research and make a link with the researchers. So the technical solutions that are developed or agreed upon in the platforms are tested and, and grounded in actual use cases in these communities. These communities are very broad from plant sciences, proteomics, metagenomics to different aspects of human data. To make the data actually open and fair, um, Elixir has many different ways and uh, doing this is really the reason why Elixir uh, exists. So there's a number of core data resources defined. Uh, these are services such as, for example, Uniprot or EuroPMC, which would severely affect uh, the majority of life science researchers if they would disappear. Next, we have the data deposition databases. This is the mechanism that we use to make data publicly available for all researchers in Europe and beyond. Uh, the European Nucleotide Archive will uh, feature later on in the presentation and is one of uh, many uh, deposition databases. Also, interoperability is a really important aspect. We have a list of recommended interoperability resources. These are services that provide uh, added value or uh, registries to improve the interoperability across all of these bioinformatic resources. Uh, Fairsharing.org is a one uh, prominent example there. And there's a number of other registries um, to collect softwares and biotools workflows in workflowhub.eu. We'll talk about that later on, but also containers, training materials, and the standards that I already mentioned. So Elixir really tries to bring all of this together and make this as uh, fluent and, and seamless as possible for researchers to work with. Then switching gears towards what the COVID-19 data platform is, about a year ago, um, the European Commission, together with EMBL EBI, the European Bioinformatics Institute, started this uh, project, the European COVID-19 data platform, to gather relevant data on COVID to uh, facilitate research on those data and uh, try to get us out of this pandemic as soon as possible. This is um, grown to a elaborate collaboration across Europe and beyond. This works together with the national infrastructures because not all data can be shared publicly uh, in a central repository. This works together closely with the European research infrastructures. Elixir is coordinating this, but also many other life science research infrastructures are involved, uh, for example, on clinical trials or biobanking. And we are now expanding this also to other disciplines such as social sciences uh, or epidemiological and healthcare data. And also this links to the global initiatives um, everywhere in the world, things are happening. So we are also making sure that this aligns with what's happening there. And all of this together allows us to 
accelerate COVID-19 research by making data available uh, and accessible to researchers. We do this in a number of projects. We're uh, specifically involved in the Elixir Converter on data management and EOS Live around the analysis. The COVID data portal has a lot of different data types. Um, it started mainly with the molecular ones. We're now also expanding into social sciences, for example. Today, we'll be mainly talking about viral sequences, as that is what we've been focusing on here in Belgium and within Elixir Belgium. The focus of the presentation today will be how we can uh, make data available into the COVID-19 data portal and specifically ENA from Belgian research. And on the other hand, how we can use the data that's available there to analyze it through Galaxy and workflows that are publicly shared. And with that, I give the word to my colleague, Miguel, to take you uh, into the submission of viral data. Um, thanks, Frederick. <clears throat> so like you said, we're gonna focus on, on sequence data, specifically sequence data submission. Um, and right now, if you have SARS-CoV uh, sequence data, there's two places where it can be deposited. Uh, the first one is GISAID. That's the global initiative um, for um, all influenza data sharing. Um, and there's also the European Nucleotide Archive, the ENA, which is also part of uh, INSDC, which is a global collaboration between um, nucleotide repositories. So GISAID is, um, takes consensus sequences of SARS-CoV-2 and it's tied with some neat visualization um, uh, tools like next strain. The access to GISAID for both getting data and submitting data is via registration um, by mail. And it also has quite a few restrictions on data reuse. The ENA, on the other hand, is fully open. It has a more sophisticated um, metadata model that goes along with the data. It takes di very different types of sequence uh, formats. So it will take also the consensus, but also the raw reads. It will take annotations and genes. And like uh, Frederick mentioned, it's also integrated with the COVID-19 data portal along with uh, other platforms like Galaxy. So what we observed was that in Belgium, most researchers were submitting their SARS-CoV sequences to GISAID uh, and none to the ENA. And so our objective was to, to change this, so to increase the number of SARS-CoV uh, submissions to the ENA. And for this, we decided that we would lower the technical barrier uh, for bulk submissions, so for large numbers of sequences. And we did this by um, developing a tool and featuring it in Galaxy, which is a user-friendly environment, and also by changing and simplifying the metadata input, which can be a bit challenging uh, for users. Um, <clears throat> we also, in parallel, uh, using this tool, had a brokering service for Belgian researchers in which we identified um, labs that were submitting sequences to GSA but not to ENA and offered to broker the submissions to the public repository to ENA, and we did this for the Institute of Tropical Medicine as well as for the, the ULB. And as it is now, these are the only Belgian uh, raw sequence data you can find on the ENA. So what does the submission tool look like? Well, there is a command line interface tool, the ENA upload tool, which was developed um, in collaboration with uh, Beyond Gruning's group at Freiburg. And this tool takes data, so the sequences, and the metadata. So this is data describing the sequences, such as uh, location, age of the patients, and so on. And it has a one-step submission process, which is already much simpler than the current submission process uh, to ENA. In order to further uh, simplify the process, this tool was wrapped into a Galaxy tool, uh, which is a, an environment that is much more user-friendly, and I will discuss uh, next what uh, what Galaxy is and how it makes um, uh, data analysis and uh, submissions like this uh, easier for the user. So what is Galaxy? Well, it's a data analysis platform. It is web-based uh, and it's very easy to use. Um, it is free 
it is open source and has many, many tools, uh, over 8,000 tools at this moment. And as you can see from the graph, it is uh, increasingly popular. It's, I think it's reflected by the citations uh, of the user galaxy in different papers. And on top of all this, there is support for users in the form of uh, tutorials, uh, trainings, and so on. Uh, like I said before, Galaxy is easy. It is web-based, so there's no installation needed. And the, you don't need to have any bioinformatics background or programming background to be able to run complex analysis tools and, and generate um, visualizations of data. It is also reproducible. So Galaxy will keep a track of all the analysis done to the data. And it is reusable and transparent in the sense that users can then share all these steps which are called a history. Uh, they can also share workflows that they develop and they can share visualizations um, of their data. Uh, and the technical side is also scalable. So Galaxy can be implemented, can be run from laptop. It can be run from your institution's uh, servers. It can be run from the cloud. And as Federico mentioned, it is cross domain. So um, it started up uh, by having bioinformatics tools, but it's now expanded um, tools including chemistry, uh, chemistry analysis, ecology, climate science, you name it. There's uh, all sorts of disciplines where you can do analysis with Galaxy. So this is what it looks like. Uh, there's three panels. The one on the left has all the tools that are available in a little search engine to find the one that you're interested in. The panel on the right is called the history panel and it has all your data objects as well as the results of your analysis. And the middle panel is where the tool that you're running is. And here you can choose what data to analyze, uh, change the parameters of, uh, of the tool, and also um, execute. So which tools are available? Um, so we're 8,000 tools as of February this year. Here I made a, a little top 10 list. Um, yeah, the most popular one are still bioinformatics tools, but you can see that even statistics, uh, visualization, and text manipulation tools made it into the top 10. And Galaxy has something called the IUC, which is a group of people that maintain high quality tools and also support uh, tool developers with best practices. Uh, tools can be uh, concatenated or combined to make workflows. Uh, and in Galaxy, this is very simple because you can do this via graphical user interface. And Ignacio will um, discuss uh, workflows uh, in more detail next. Um, like I mentioned before, the Galaxy community spans very many different disciplines. And some of these uh, will actually have their own dedicated Galaxy instance, which will be populated with the tools that are relevant to that particular discipline. If you would like to use Galaxy, uh, there's three main servers uh, that you can access, public servers. Uh, we also, well, Ignacio uh, looks after the Belgian uh, Galaxy instance, usegalaxy.be. And there's also uh, many other uh, domain-specific Galaxy instances that you can try out. And the last thing is that uh, there is support for users. There is something called the Galaxy Training Network, which has collected uh, and developed tutorials and trainings covering, well, here's 21 topics, uh, both for users and for Galaxy developers and administrators. And the one final note would be that uh, VIB and Alexia Belgium are organizing the next Galaxy Community Conference um, in Ghent, but of course, uh, given the circumstances, it's going to be held uh, online. And so now I, uh, I pass on to Ignacio who will discuss the use of Galaxy for COVID. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, so I take over from here. Um, I'm gonna talk about Galaxy specific analysis for um, COVID data. Uh, so the first thing that I want to discuss is why we chose um, Galaxy to analyze COVID data. So for us, it was quite a, an easy uh, decision because we have been using Galaxy for quite a long time. But if you look at it uh, in a not subjective way, you can see that Galaxy is really a platform that is oriented to towards uh, analyzing open data. 
So it has a lot of tools and connections with um, open data repositories, as like for example, ENA and all that uh, Frederick already mentioned. Um, it's also quite user friendly and it's aimed towards uh, biologists and people like from wet lab that have no idea about how to install a tool, how to install, install dependencies, but can really generate biological no knowledge out of um, open data. Um, so it's also deployed in many uh, countries, in many nodes, uh, especially on Elixir. Um, so you can already, as a user, just get the resources required to do the analysis. So you don't really need to have them available in your lab and you don't need to, to use your local resources. And it's also a production grade service. So it's been used for quite a long time, as I said, not just by us, but a large community. So there's nothing really that needs to be developed in terms of the, the analysis platform. We just need to encourage uh, people to, to submit and to publish high quality data to the open plat platforms, as Miguel mentioned, to these uh, submission tools, and then we take care of the analysis. Um, so as part of the community effort that uh, Miguel mentioned before, uh, since there are quite different um, type of communities in the galaxy um, environment, um, as soon as the data start to flow uh, last year at the start of the pandemic, um, the repositories started uh, being populated with open data uh, and the community started developing uh, different kind of workflows to analyze this. Um, so this was kind of easy to do because we just created a um, single repository where it describes each of these workflows and it acts as a repository for the world for themselves. So anyone that just goes into COVID-19.galaxy project can access the description of what this, each of these workflows do. They're highly curated. They have a lot of um, versions like evolving in time and you can just export them and start using them with your own data or with other public data. So this is just an example of what things are deposited there. Um, but as you can see, it goes from uh, public data um, towards a really reporting work, uh, reporting of, of what knowledge do you extract from the analysis. Um, so what's the idea of this? So the idea is that, um, yeah, shortly after the, the open data started to flow into the repositories, we quickly developed a lot of workflows that are publicly available. We put them in a repository and everyone that has some biological knowledge and can take care of this, they can run it in those public instances. So what we mean with this, the key aspect of this is that we are trying to demonstrate one of the big aspects of open data. And that is that it can really accelerate the development of knowledge using it. That is because we are using an open uh, platform for data analysis. And that means that anyone can make analysis using it. Uh, so this is basically the idea that is uh, explained in this paper. Okay, so I mentioned that uh, we put everything in one repository and we are sharing these workflows with the community. This is simple because we are focusing on one type of, of workflow, which is related with COVID-19 data analysis. But what if a researcher wants to do some kind of analysis related with other data sets and with other kind of analysis? And then this is a problematic we already knew beforehand, but it really accelerated and it showed up um, during the pandemic because people started to want to do more and more analysis and they wanted to search for workflows and they wanted to look for workflows that were really high quality and they can reuse. So, with this in mind, of course, this idea of creating a single repository is not going to escalate to create repositories for every kind of workflow and for every kind of situation. So with this in mind, we collaborated with other research groups to develop what I'm going to talk about, which is the workflow hub. So what's important about workflows? So if you look at publication and if you even just go to conference and, and, and talk with other people and they mention what they mean with the world phone and how did they actually achieve a biological um, analysis that is published, for example, you will see that a world phone can, can be anything. I mean, it can be uh, from a batch script to a Galaxy workflow and it can be put in different kind of repositories. Some people keep them in GitHub, 
that is at least open normally. Uh, they sometimes put it in a special repos or local repositories. So it's really difficult to get an idea of what a workflow is. But nevertheless, workflows for us, and especially uh, from what I mentioned before, it's clear that workflow contains a lot of knowledge on itself. And it's an object that it represents all the knowledge that the researchers obtain and collect it to actually do the analysis. They definitely try different tools, they different try different versions of the workflow, and they, in the end, they uh, created the analysis using one specific version of it and one specific instance of a workflow. So for us, uh, workflows are first class objects. So we want to treat them like that and we want to uh, create an environment to um, use them and reuse them. So since Galaxy, since, uh, sorry, workflows do have a lot of complex definitions. Sometimes uh, the definitions and the description are just in the context of a publication and it's in a natural language and it's difficult to extract, except if you read all the publication and all the details. And sometimes even the details are not really described in the publication. So we need a few things to actually treat the workflows as fair objects. And for this, we, de we decided that we need two specific aspects. One is to, first of all, create or use a standard method that enables um, putting the workflow data, that is the data sets that represent the workflow, um, together with the metadata in a standard language that we can extract information out of it. And the second part is to actually have a kind of registry that also works as a search engine that one without knowledge of any repository or anything can look based on the idea that one have or what you want to do, which kind of workflows you want, to search for workflows and to actually find them. So first of all, I will talk about ArrowCrate. ArrowCrate is a really lightweight approach for packaging the research data, in this case, a workflow instance, a workflow definition together with the metadata. So for this, it uses two things. First, uh, schema.org, which describes different types of assets. In this case, it will be a workflow instance, but it could be any kind of data sets. It could be uh, external resources. It could be anything. Uh, schema describes um, a structure for this, and it sets uh, a, a language to describe this. And it also uses JSONLD, which is a quite established um, method to, to, to make sense of linked data in the semantic web. So just to be clear, what it does is puts in a package, which could be just a directory, a folder, or, or, or a zip file. It puts um, the files that you want to put, which in this case will be workflow instances, and it includes together with it a metadata file, which is in this JSON lead format. And together, and in that file, um, you describe all the elements that you put in the in the package using schema.org. So as I mentioned, we want to put a workflow, so we need schema type that represents a workflow. So for that, we extended the schema, and we by by using the the, the bioschema.org project, we extended the schema. To, to have a specific type that represents a computational workflow. If you go to this link, you can see all the um, details that you need to fill to actually represent metadata related with the workflow. So you will see you have, you have to define the inputs, the outputs, the creator, and, and so on. And once you have all these um, values and all these keywords related with the workflow, you have some metadata related with the workflow. Um, the other thing that I mentioned we will be needed is, of course, a registry. So a registry collects all this metadata uh, around workflows and lets you um, uh, search for it. So the key aspect of this is, well, we are now treating workflows as fair objects. So we need identifiers and persistence around this. Um, so we also, as I mentioned before, we have much uh, richer metadata and packaging following community standards. So the description around the workflow, it's standardized. And also, of course, as I mentioned before, um, the researchers develop the workflow in time. So it can happen that the tools versions uh, evolve. It can happen that uh, the workflow itself evolve. 
So all this evolution and the and, and the steps in the life cycle of, of a workflow are also registering this um, registry together with, with the provenance. And also what is important is uh, we have a machine readable um, way to actually discover the workflows. So no matter what kind of workflow it is, you can always ask for it uh, using the, the standard metadata independently of uh, whether it's a Galaxy workflow, it's just a bash script, or it's using a Apache Airflow or whatever kind of workflow management system. So the idea is the makers of the workflows actually submit the um, the yeah the metadata associated with with the with the workflow and they keep track of it it's not it's important to know that it's not an execution format um, portal it's just to keep track of uh, instances and the metadata associated with it so this is pretty much what you see if you um, enter the the web page uh, the most important part are of course how to search for workflows and how to contribute to um, to to yeah to our repository. Um, if you search, well, of course you can contribute. It's open to anyone. Take into account that it's a beta release that was kind of accelerated last year, but uh, any input is welcome. Uh, if you search for a workflow using any kind of keyword, you will see that an entry looks something like this. You have uh, metadata information, for example, like the number of steps, the inputs and the outputs. You have metrics related with the website accession. And as I mentioned before, the packaging method and the standard method we use to put an instance of a workflow is arrow crate. So you can always export the arrow crate from the website. And there you will see what I mentioned before about the details of what's, what's, what kind of metadata is included in an arrow crate. Um, as I mentioned before, it's not uh, an execution platform, but of course, since you are collecting a lot of metadata, you can add some services on top of it. So, for example, in this case, um, knowing that a workflow is, a, is, a, is of a type of Galaxy, you can link it to an execution pl platform, in this case, you search the DU. So, you just click on this button and you go to the execution platform and you can run it. Um, now it's the turn again from Miguel. Right, so uh, last thing on the uh, SARS-CoV-2 sequence submission tool um, that we want to say is about the packing of it. So I mentioned that this um, command line tool had been uh, wrapped in a Galaxy tool to make it more accessible to researchers who didn't necessarily have bioinformatics um, background. Um, and on top of that, we added, we package um, Galaxy itself uh, with the upload tool and the human read screening tool and some of the other objects you need to do a submission into a, um, a Docker uh, container. So now there's different ways of uh, deploying this or using the tool. The first is you can actually um, download and deploy the container uh, whatever you choose to. So this can be your laptop or it can be uh, the server at your institution or it can be a cloud uh, service. Uh, we have a uh, instance, so we have deployed this container, the submission container at COVID-19 usegalaxy.be uh, and is uh, running with our brokering um, credentials. So this is for uh, facilitating submissions for Belgian researchers and they can they can do the submission under our brokering credentials. Uh, and the last way to using the submission tool is to go into one of the public Galaxy servers where the tool should be findable. A little bit more about our brokering. So this is a dedicated instance, as I mentioned before. It has our brokering um, credentials for the ENA. It is uh, run on the Flemish Supercomputing Center cloud. So it has resources to do analysis, uh, and it also has bandwidth to upload uh, large amounts of data to the ENA. Yeah, if you choose to use this uh, submission container, this is what you will get. Uh, the tools, as you can see, there's not as many tools because it's dedicated just for submission. Uh, and there's some uh, documentation on how to use the tool, but if you if you want to get the full um, the full documentation on, on 
can go to our, our research data management uh, page at elixirbelgium.org and there's a thorough documentation on the use of the submission tool. On top of that, we have also made a walkthrough, so a step script that you can watch um, if you prefer to watch a video rather than, than read the documentation. So I think that's the last on the submission tool. And now I think turn over to Frederick uh, for concluding remarks. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Miguel. So what we try to do here is, is use the infrastructure that we had already available before the whole pandemic started from the supercomputing center to Galaxy to all the tools that were already integrated, the connection we had with the EBI and specifically the European Nucleotide Archive to really package this all together as user-friendly as possible to be able to take data within Belgium, submit this to the um, COVID-19 data portal to make it publicly available for globally everybody, and then use all of this data to analyze it within Galaxy. And uh, as you've seen, use Workflow Hub to make these uh, workflows that are being developed uh, all available with all the nitty gritty details in uh, Workflow Hub. And this is being put forward as an exemplar implementation of the European Open Science Cloud. We're doing this in a global context, uh, building on existing and open infrastructure. And I cannot stress uh, hard enough that this existing open infrastructure was crucial to really make this happen and um, because we could leverage this and uh, hit the ground running, so to speak. What do we plan for future work? Uh, we want to integrate a few more workflows into this mission uh, container so we can accommodate the usual or the standard cases. We want to submit also the consensus sequences, so the assembled sequences to ENA. And we started exploring to simultaneously submit to ENA and GIS8, as this is a practice that many labs already do. Towards the somewhat longer future, uh, variant data is becoming more and more important, and um, we are working together with EBI on uh, integrating that aspect too, so you can more easily compare which variant uh, is um, found in the samples and how that uh, evolves across Europe. And also we're looking to integrate these systems into data management platforms such as Ferdom and Seek. Ultimately, all this work around COVID fits into the broader picture of um, a platform towards the future for pandemic um, or future pandemics with infectious diseases. So everything we learn here, everything we build here is meant to build an integrated sustainable health research and healthcare ecosystem. We've included here some references to all of the work that we've been doing. And finally, I want to thank our funders. Um, Elixir is funded by uh, FWO in Flanders, uh, with also support of the Department of Economy, Science and Innovation. And uh, specifically for the analysis part, we are involved in the EOSC Life project, uh, which is a Horizon 2020 project. Due to this funding that was already in place, we've been able to switch the majority of the Elixir Belgium team very rapidly to focus on COVID. And I want to stress here also that this is a truly collaborative effort. And you've seen some of the people that were involved talking today. Uh, we had a very nice collaboration with the Supercomputer Center that provides all the resources uh, for Galaxy. Um, we are closely working with the Galaxy team in Freiburg with the people at EBI to make all these links uh, as efficient as possible. And beyond that, we're working really in a global community and that has been a, a fantastic resource and a fantastic collaboration to make this all happen. We've done part of it as we've shown the data submission and uh, Workflow Hub was uh, our main focus, um, but all the other uh, pieces of the puzzle 
uh, are being provided in collaboration with many partners. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, you should be able to uh, speak up uh, through the system or you can put them into the chat box. Um, of course, you can also reach out uh, to us later on if you want. Yes, Friedrich, it's correct that uh, the people in the audience should be able to ask their questions out loud. Um, but if they came into the session in listen-only mode, then you have to reconnect to the audio. So there's a question from Isabel in the chat. So I think the slides will be shared also by Open Belgium. We can also provide the link uh, to the Google Slides because that's how we uh, make them. So um, can already put the link here in the chat uh, now, but later on they will be available uh, in uh, the platform of, of Open Belgium. Yes, correct. And, and so thanks, Ignacia, for putting the link. And then the, the second question is, how do you envision collaboration between Elixir uh, at the EU level and the emergent European health data space? Uh, yes, so this is what we are currently planning. Um, so there's a number of upcoming uh, Horizon Europe calls. Uh, I'm not sure if they're all already publicly announced, but they uh, will be very soon, if not, um, to really make that connection. So to go beyond the, the viral data, beyond the molecular data, and move into the healthcare data, and then specifically the European health data space. Um, this, uh, these projects are being written as we speak um, to involve all the relevant partners uh, across Europe um, and uh, yeah, so to make sure that this data is uh, being interlinked. Uh, the European health data space is in a relatively early uh, phase, um, but um, yeah, I don't have the details yet because the, the projects are still being developed, but that's the, the next thing basically on the agenda to do. Are there any more questions or suggestions? Also, if you have data uh, related to COVID that you want to make available, do not hesitate to contact us. We can see how we can help you and uh, either ourselves or bring you in contact with the right people at the European level. I don't see more questions at this point. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention for uh, to Open Belgium for uh, organizing this. And um, have a nice day uh, and a nice week. Thank you. Thank you very much for the interesting session. I also wish you a very nice day. I present today what we've been doing.